So ideas in business, they are not the most important things by far. It's the execution, how you execute it. Chris, can you build me an online shop? And I'm like, uh, you don't need to build an online shop. Google is pushing AI really hard, but the AI is I'm just not there yet. What's one thing that made you happy? Oh, speaking of happy, so Zapier makes you happier. In fact, they did recently. Hello and welcome to another episode of Masterful.info, the podcast where we help entrepreneurs and business owners to master their business. Today's hosts are Will, Chris and Makar. Today's main topic will be the most common pitfalls in startups. Hi guys, how are you guys doing today? Pretty good, thank you. I'm fantastic, thank you. How are you? Good, awesome. I'm very excited for today's episode. All right, so Chris and Will, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. You both obviously work on startups from sort of different perspectives. Will, you do a lot of marketing for startups and Chris, you help startups figure out the tech sides of their business. Would that be pretty accurate? Yeah. So do each of you have a story, uh, maybe with a startup that you've been working over the years or a startup that you had recently where you just saw what they were doing and you thought, what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing it like this? This is obviously the wrong way to conduct your business. And how did you navigate that? So maybe we could start with a story from each one of you as an example. Yeah, I'm always surprised that people who don't have a clue about startups don't listen to experts who have a lot of experience in startups. And only if you are really like good in your area of expertise, it doesn't mean you are good in understanding how startups work. And yeah, recently I had a client, they were really difficult to consult and um, you are telling them how to do it better. And they are like uh, postponing the launch of the project because they are having thousand ideas. And I'm trying like to explain them uh, we have to focus, we have to launch first and then learn from, from the experience with the users. And they are like, ah, oh, I'm so creative. I have uh, this idea, this idea. I want to implement this feature. And then uh, one month is passing by like without launching. Uh, two months later, we are, haven't launched. And then after a while, I'm like, okay, guys, now we just need to launch everything necessary for the launch. And then they are complaining. Yeah, it's so it, it costs. We have such high costs and we haven't earned anything. <laughs> and for me, it's like, yeah, I have been telling you to launch, to start uh, learning and to start uh, progressing and uh, creating revenue. It's not just an art where you can just create something beautiful. It's all about um, data from users. Do you think that's perfectionism? Yeah, I think it's like fear of um, judgment, maybe, and e ego. Like they want to show the world how great they are, how beautiful the website is. But the, the beauty is just in their eyes. And the target audience um, has a different perspective on that. They have a different like mindset. They are searching in Google for a certain thing. And then they find something and they have they, they need clarity, not just like fancy website. The world isn't watching, by the way. The world isn't watching. If you if you're afraid that the world is watching yeah. you and is gonna judge you, nobody nobody's watching you. Nobody cares about your business except for you. Exactly. Right? Exactly. There there are thousands of websites every day like popping out. And yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Yeah, they overestimate how people will look at the website and how important the website is for for majority of people. <laughs> Speaking of e-commerce, I think this is one thing recently I hear quite often. Um, I, I sometimes get approached by people and entrepreneurs. They they share ideas with me, like, "Oh, I have a new idea for this online shop. I found someone with great products, but they don't know how to sell it. They only do it on a flea market, for instance. And I want to pr bring it online. So, Chris, can you build me an online shop? And I'm like, uh, n you don't need to build an online shop. I mean, um, so my beginning and of my professional career is back in." yeah 2008 where i actually 
worked for Rocket Internet, working on one of the first e-commerce startups there. And it's different now. So back then we needed kind of to develop like a website, like a system, like everything, even though there were some things around like Magento, but still you had to do a lot of customization back then. So, but these days it's like 15 years past. We have things you can just like go and crap and stick things together and then it would work. So usually I go there like, um, okay, that's cool that you want to set up uh, e-commerce and online shop, but, um, don't overthink it. Don't overdo it. Just go to, to Shopify, for instance. You don't need to think about hosting, maintenance, everything like that, or IT security. You just go there, you select a really decently looking design. This is also one thing which Will already mentioned, like, to make it perfect. This is, like, the worst thing you can actually do. But anyway, I tell them, like, okay, go to Shopify, set it up, add your products, make sure that these things are correct. Um, hook up payment systems like Shopify has pay, uh, Shopify payments. You can also integrate different payment channels. But anyway, make sure your business, uh, like you know what you want to do, you, you know what you need to sell, like what the processes are behind your business and just execute them correctly. And like you said in the beginning, no one is watching. So mistakes are forgiven. Like if you have a couple of customers, you can handle pretty much any mistake. So focus on, on the really important things. And then when you see in what direction you want to go, you then can think about like, what do I really need to build? Like from a technical point of view. Yes. So I think that speaks to ambition, right? Everybody wants to have their own social media. Everybody wants to make their own chat feature, even if it's completely not needed uh, because they heard that, you know, WhatsApp and Facebook are doing well. And so that's probably what they need to do for their business as well to succeed, even though they might be in a completely different business. Yeah. To, to um, add on to the technical side of things, uh, usually when people start like to fantasize of, oh, we want to build the biggest, better, badass online shop next. We want to be, become the next Amazon. I'm like, you know, a start, as soon as you start building something you on your own, you, you you kind of go in the direction of becoming a tech company. Think about it. So you also may have to make sure that you're hiring the, high, the right people for this. So um, like you said, you, you you don't need to build the, the next social media platform to be present on social media. There are platforms already around. You need to focus on your unique thing first. Yeah, I think people underestimate how much effort it is actually to create a proper online shop or online website or something that has certain functionalities. They think it's like you, you draw it on a paper, piece of paper, and then the developer just do some magic and it's done. <laughs> and the reality is, yeah, it's, there is so much going on. You need to think about so many things that you don't see. So like, um, how f fast is it loading? Is it like, built or uh, very inefficiently and uh, whenever you have a little bit of success and the website goes down for example or is it like user friendly is it uh, in the back in the background is it properly developed so that you can expand the functionalities so there are so many things going on and you have to plan it in advance it's not just uh, coming up continuously with new ideas. So ideas in business, they are not the most important things by far. It's the execution, how you execute it. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, that's well said. Well, so having worked in startups with your guys' experience, what's a time where you found yourself entering into a startup? Maybe they hired you or they're asking you to consult and you just go, oh, no, what am I doing here? This isn't what I thought this would be because obviously what startups are kind of famous for is the very soft culture, right? That they have, maybe they're not very established yet. They don't quite know how to do certain things. So do you have any stories where you got to a company that uh, you're thinking of working with or that already hired you to do something for them and you go, Oh no, what did I get myself into these guys? I have no idea what they're doing yet. Like it comes oftentimes you, you have, you see a, a startup with a good budget and you assume like uh, they must be pretty good in all those areas because they have, can afford the best people kind of. And then like a 
few years ago, I joined a startup that was growing like crazy and they had, they were earning so much money. So they could afford in theory, like the best of the best people. And then <laughs> I, I joined their, their uh, team. And uh, like I took, I said, like, I, I want to take a look at Google ads. Uh, I, my responsibility was for content management in the beginning. And then I asked like, yeah, uh, why are you using this form as a landing page? And did you do a B testing before? And they said, no, we haven't done a B testing before, but, uh, it's the best it performs the best. <laughs> so I was like really uh, surprised, uh, to, uh, and I was like, okay, maybe I'm missing something because it's not possible that someone who is investing uh, half a million euros in, into Google ads every month is, uh, hasn't been testing, uh, different types of landing pages. And after a while, after I dove deeper into their Google ads account, I realized, oh yes, they have such a, they have so many problems in their Google ads account. It's very inefficient. They are spending so much time managing it without uh, progressing much. So yeah, then after that, I took over the whole Google ads account and like we needed uh, several months to bring it up to the speed. And that's, um, I think there, there are like two problems or two reasons for this, what happened. First of all, in the beginning you grow, like you, you are, you have limited funds and you are on a small scale. So you hire people like you hire cheap, affordable, like agencies who maybe are okay for a small scale. If you invest thousand euros per month, you don't need the best of the best. Mediocre is also good enough oftentimes because you cannot afford the best of the best, but then you grow so fast. And then suddenly you need really like people who know what they're doing. And the second reason was this person was always thinking about cheapest sir like cheapest employers and cheapest service providers and that's not the right thing because just because she was saving a little bit of money with the agency he was he was losing several millions of euros over like span of of a year and <laughs> that's uh so if he would pay even double the money for an agency and they wouldn't lose millions of dollars, uh, euros, it would be a total win for them. Yeah. So would you say you have to know where you are financially and you have to act accordingly because there are some startups that have no money and they act like they're Google. And then there are some startups that have a ton of money and they act like they're running out of a basement with two people. Right. So it's yeah. important to know where you are in your journey. That's so true. Yeah. In the beginning, you don't have this feeling or understanding of how much effort ha certain businesses uh, have. For example, they are more complicated businesses and they are simpler businesses. For example, if you want to create to like sell products from China or from Asia, uh, from other countries in Asia, uh, there, and especially if you have like electronics devices, there are so many difficulties, so many challenges, or even like toys or something. And then you have to think, okay, do I have the capacity? Maybe I should s start with a much simpler idea. And then as soon as I have experience and funds, I can uh go to the more difficult businesses and of course they cannot um they cannot understand which of those businesses business ideas uh are more complicated so that's where consultants uh, come in sometimes um, a consultancy even if it costs a few hundred dollars half an hour one hour consultancy can save you thousands of of dollars or euros 
and a lot of effort because those consultants, if you find the right one, of course, uh, they have worked with so many different projects. So they have already a pretty good understanding of um, what works and what doesn't work. And I'm not talking about consultants who have been consultants all their life, who like don't know what happens after they consult. I'm talking about experienced uh, people who have been hands-on in startups and now offering uh, consultancy as part of their service. Yeah, very interesting points. Chris, what about you? Uh, is there a company that you came in and you just said, what are you guys doing on the tech side? That, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I was thinking of one particular customer. I won't name them, um, but um, it was quite interesting. In the beginning, they reached out to me. Um, actually, it was a friend of mine. They're, they He started working for them. And um, I think he assumed the position as a CTO at that company. And he, he didn't tell me like any background story, like how he ended up at that company in the first place. But um, he was, was reaching out to me. He was like, hey, um, I know you guys, you are uh, right now helping companies with uh, systems administration. Um, that was in a time when people were considering like, okay, should we go to AWS? Should we have our own uh, infrastructure? Things like that. And um, we we tried to help the companies like um, setting up their own systems because there were some compliance reasons that they couldn't move to AWS. I mean, things change over the years. So now AWS really stepped up their compliance game. I usually recommend going with them. But back then we got approached by them. We're like, okay, um, so Chris, can you help us like set up some 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 staging environment for a new infrastructure we are planning to do? I'm like, okay, so let me know the requirements you, you need, like what are the specifications of your applications? What, how does the network thing look like? Is there any backend? Is there like database servers, things of that nature? So it took a while, so I could feel that they were quite busy. But at some point, I got all the documents, and I was like, okay, reviewing everything, came up with a plan, how to set up, how to structure it. And within a few weeks, I, I yeah, compiled everything, also got the first staging environment on like one bare metal server, like, you know, those pizza boxes. Um, I got it running, and I handed it over, and then I... Yeah, radio silence. <laughs> I mean, no one was talking to me anymore. I, I thought like, okay, interesting. A, a little bit feedback, you know, would be great. I mean, they paid the invoice, so that was some kind of feedback. But um, at the same time, I would love to know like how are things working on it and yada, yada, yada. And uh, at some point, the guy reached out to me again. I was like, can we hire you like for six to eight weeks? Because we have a few other things we need to work on. I was like, what do you mean, hiring me for six to eight weeks, like full time? Yeah, that would be really great. We have some scalability issues, and I believe it's within the software, but uh, no one can really find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, I mean, back then I was working mainly with PHP, so this was my 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 main language whenever I was building something for the web. Um, they wrote something in Java. And I knew a little bit Java back then. I was like, okay, I need to refresh my knowledge and then I can help you. So I joined that company. And like you said, the moment you opened up the box and you got like, uh, got to see things, you were like, uh, okay, it doesn't make much sense what they are doing. And they're also not following like best practices, like in terms of how things are set up, also architecture. So um, this was really interesting. So. At some point, we we were we so I did like a tech audit. I opened up the source codes. I, I went through everything. I tried to replicate everything on like a small machine to see like how things are com communicating. And um, yeah, it turns out that a lot of things were flawed because um, this comes back to this whole get someone who actually has experience in building um, inf not just infrastructure but also how to architect and design your, your backend applications. Um, because that company, it's also a startup. Back then they, they were like a year, year old. And their first CTO was like a software engineer. And he basically took a few things from here and there and from some competitors and was 
throwing things together mm. and then whenever he heard some terms like oh i should do load balancing okay um i need to build something my own on my own and um he did this for a few more things and no matter what he touched he did it wrong <laughs> it was like atrocious it's it was crazy and um i remember talking to the ceo of that company and he was like oh it's really really crucial that we don't have any downtime so whenever um our former cto said we need to deploy there's going to be a downtime i was like how's that even possible like how much transactions do you have right right now and he said something like yeah, about every three seconds, one on average. So what does it mean? Like average, you know, this is like the average. So there can be like a curve. There can be times where mm -hmm. there's going to be like 10 transactions a second. And there can be like things where nothing is going on for minutes. So they try to deploy at 3 a.m. in the morning because there's this, um, you know, there's like nothing going on and things could still go wrong. And then they are struggling. So this was one thing where I was like, why didn't you speak to someone who's experienced in this? Well, um, yeah, to, to, to wrap up the story, um, I spent like 12 months to not just like, um, re, yeah, re, kind of reinvent or re, redesign the whole infrastructure, but also like all the software ha had to be rewritten. We needed to get rid of so many mistakes. And at some point, um, you said mm -hmm. it before, like the taping, you know, the virtual duct tape, it's infinite. So we, we had to apply on, on some certain things and components because mm -hmm. they were certified. <laughs> we couldn't touch them anymore. They were like, they kind of work, but not always. So mm -hmm. we started like to wrap around things like, okay, whenever there's this error occurring, just try it again and see what happens next. And if not, restart it after a while. So it was a mess. But um, yeah, to what, what what's the lesson from this? So the guy who co-founded the company back then, he was a developer. He was uh, quite fast at writing good code, but he wasn't really up to the task to manage a team. So he also, at some point, they hired people, but he was working on his like tiny little niche kind of thing. He couldn't really delegate um, to do some tasks and they were also not hiring the right people because the other ones back then, they were also kind of, juniorish or at least they required some some attention like someone who could set up a strategy and say like hey this is the goal this is what we want to build and we need to build and we pull all all along the same tack so um yeah you definitely in the beginning as a startup because you that that startup it was also kind of self-funded they were profitable mm -hmm. but they didn't have like a huge budget so you cannot hire mm -hmm. like a team of superstar engineers so circling back to the point will brought up you have you have you need to hire an expert like for a few hours but have like a mentoring kind of thing that that guy is gonna tell you like okay listen you want to achieve this business goal you need to set up the the, the foundation foundation like that so that would have helped so much in the beginning i would say for that startup because that they would have avoided so many issues and pitfalls also they spoke to some agencies mm -hmm. running infrastructure in some data centers they they had to rent and they were kind of selling only their own services they were not really talking to what, <laughs> what they wanted to build so you also have to kind of be aware who you're talking to and what they want to achieve. So sometimes you need to spend some time digging through a few consultants and experts. And then the best, what I always recommend is going over recommendations. So if there's someone you know already, talk to them. Don't go somewhere to some agency or don't do some ad and, and go there and have some vague problem statement because they might see a different picture as well so you definitely need to have someone who knows like a little bit of everything but has seen the full picture and big picture at a certain scale and especially at the scale you want to go so um this is really let me repeat it important to talk to a consultant and then have him like on a retainer basis like a few hours that you can have like a sparings partner you don't need to hire people full time not in the beginning, just have like the most important things covered. And then you can, you can also see and learn and develop like knowledge within your company. 
So um, yeah, this was the biggest learning I saw. And luckily I didn't have to make it on my own with my own money. So they were <laughs> losing quite some money in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They had downtimes and issues and some of their clients, they were threatening to leave. And eventually we, we made it that everything was like deployments without zero, like with zero downtime. So, and um, we also had like some monitoring in place and logging facilities so that we could talk to the customers because at some point, if your clients see or customers see like you are not working all the time, it's easy to blame you then because that was, they were a B2B uh, software as a service company. So um, their clients were like, oh, it didn't work again. It must be, it must have been your, your issue again, like somewhere, somewhere down in your software stack. And then we didn't tell anyone that we started like logging every interaction with the system. And then we brought up like, guys, please read, doc read the documentation carefully. There is that you need to send those parameters. That's, that's what you did. Then you had this outcome. So we didn't do any mistake. Please just be careful what you're inputting in the system and then you get an output. They were so stunned and surprised. And it was the last time that they would like directly jump to play, um, playing the blame game against us, but they were more like, hey, we have some questions. So the tone really ch shifted as well. So um, yeah, enough of that tension, but. Well, let me ask a question about that because you were circling about something that I was interested in and Will also mentioned before that consultants who have never worked on anything other than consulting. Um, how do you strike a balance in your experience between not paying, you know, being stingy and not wanting to pay for a person who actually knows what they're doing and trying to save money to hire, you know, some college kid to write you code or do ads for you, you know, uh, so it's cheap versus basically being uh, taken advantage of by a law firm or by a big agency that is just gonna, you know, take advantage of your money because you have them on retainer. This is a really good one. Um, I would say in the beginning, if you start working with companies, bigger law firms and agencies of that nature, you definitely, so again, have someone, a consultant who is helping you on hourly basis. So to find that person, it's also like an interesting story because usually you should talk to people who have like firsthand experience. So don't go to a consultant who started his or her career at a consulting consulting firm. So maybe not, maybe if they have been with a firm for a couple of years, they have some experience, but usually the best people consulting and helping you and knowing what to avoid are those who burned their own money or made their own experience or burned their own fingers on something. So this is the best, in my opinion, because they already know what how to steer mm -hmm. things, how to, how to work on things. But then, so if you have mm -hmm. such a person and you need to scale it up because their time is also limited, right? It's a finite supply of time. And then you need someone to execute on what they are recommending. You want to talk to like, let's say an agency for your online marketing affairs. So maybe include that person in the beginning on strategy strategic decision-making processes so that you're like, okay, listen, this is the agency or even the agency vetting um, process. When you start looking into different companies helping you, you should have that person also within the first couple of meetings to see if they are any good. Um, this is one thing I would highly recommend if you start to scale up, have that person be part of the vetting process of your agencies you're going to hire also the, with the mm -hmm. hiring process, not necessarily like the nitty gritty of approaching people to hire, but like s let them review like the interview process, c let them come up with a few ideas, like how to, what to ask, basically things of that nature. So, um, yeah, to, to get back to your question, I would say this is, um, what I highly recommend that you you don't approach any agency and just talk to them without like having some background, uh, background mm -hmm. knowledge about it, but have someone yeah. with you who's going to help you on the, those meetings. And again, it's just a few hours of their time, but it skates really well if, as soon as yeah. you have more agencies and you are also picking up that knowledge and experience and what to ask. Yeah, I have a really funny story, at least uh, from my perspective, there was mm -hmm. an agency it was like pretty expensive, like 20, 25,000 euros per year uh, for, for that, what they have been doing, at least it was really expensive. 
because they weren't they weren't doing much so they were offering some kind of like um automatic backlinks <laughs> um anyone who has heard about search engine optimization will know that doesn't sound like a proper business model what are what are automatic backlinks automatic. tell for our listeners who yeah. don't know what are automatic backlinks so you you put so for for google to rank in google uh, it's important for other websites to link to your website uh, that's like a sign for google if for example a bigger website and and the more important website links to you the better so it's all about qu quality so if for example yeah you get a link from wikipedia or 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 um some for, um forbes.com for example if you get a link from that that's like a recommendation viewed by google but if you it's of course people tried to cheat and try to build many many backlinks from ch shitty websites and google of course knows that which website is good and which website is not yeah they were saying okay we will put um links to your website and you, to your google maps on different directories uh for for local businesses and there are, like in germany there are very few local directories that make sense and they were like saying okay 500 uh, directories automatically and in the end they were i i told to my to to the owner of the company i said they are ripping you off it's not worth it and they were trying to call me on my personal co uh, phone number they were trying to call my the owner on their personal phone number just to convince to stay and they were like having meetings and wanted to have another meeting and were explaining look at the statistics uh, of the rankings here we started doing this and here we started um, the the in it, the rankings started increasing and by digging deeper i realized like there was some coincidence they started uh, changing the website in the same time like when they started doing those backlinks but it was not the original um, reason for that <laughs> So we kicked mm -hmm. them out and yeah, nothing changed at all. <laughs> so are there business owners that think that if they spent a certain amount of money, it must be good. You know, if they spend a certain amount of money on an agency or on, on development or on something, then that guarantees quality. And then they use that, you know, as a, uh, as a way to convince themselves that they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I think I'm not sure about just pure the money, but I think there is this view on on freelancers and agencies if they act very very confident and if they um, if if they say like promise whatever the the client wants they they promise to achieve that within very like unrealistic time frame and like so i think this confidence makes an impression on at them if if, if and it, sometimes like <clears throat> those kind of like geeks they are really good in their in their work but they are not so uh, confident and they are not like oh yeah yeah no problem not all problem at all but they are like already analyzing and so okay we have here a few challenges uh, a few risks so they feel for the decision makers not very confident and not very uh, say, s certain about what they are doing. But in reality, you rather want those guys who like know their craft and are rather cautious mm -hmm. about what they are promising than those typical salespeople who are just like promising everything and not delivering anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So with your experience, both of you working with start startups, could you in a minute, do you think there's similarities between um, the owners, the CEOs of the startups that work and are successful 
And then similarly, is there something in common that people who run startups who don't do well have? Could you in a minute describe a successful startup owner or CEO? And then in a minute, describe what a non-successful one looks like using your experience working with multiple ones and seeing if there's something that overlaps. Do you know, do, do you get what I mean? Maybe, Will, you could do successful, Chris, you could do non-successful. So, Will, what does a successful startup owner or founder or CEO look like? So it's, it's the opposite of the unsuccessful, which means uh, it's all about ego. People, if they have a healthy ego, they are rather, they are, they know their limitations and everyone has limitations. You cannot be really good in all the areas. And if you have a healthy ego, you are okay with that. You are listening to critics. You are listening to other experts and you are hiring other experts because you know your limitations. I think that's, uh, that for me, that's the most important uh, um, mm -hmm. thing with successful entrepreneurs. Chris, what does a non-successful entrepreneur look like? This is a really good question because I had to think a bit and I met a few people, actually quite a lot of people who approached me for some projects, especially in the beginning, like 2010, when like the startup scene was blowing up in Europe. And... Um, most of those people mm -hmm. who approached me and w wanted to hire me for <laughs> hire is such a strong verb. Uh, I would say like uh, generate work results for equity in some delusional project to, to put it mildly. Um, <clears throat> so what I could see was um, these people are like the unsuccessful entrepreneur. They, um, they usually, they, they, they tend to dream. They dream big. They don't really set goals or unrealistic goals. They don't really understand the market that well, what they are going to, to go in. And really importantly is actually execute. Like a lot of people, they are talking a lot. They, they're like, yeah, I want to build this. I want to build that. I want to become successful on, let's say, TikTok. And, then, and but what, what they are doing. So, so when you start like, okay, have you already created some content, let's say for TikTok? And they're like, I'm still thinking, um, I'm still researching, I'm still doing this, I'm still doing that. I'm, I'm working on a script, I want to say. So I remember listening to an interview, which was really interesting. It was about creating and, um, and actually having output from, 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 from the face. He, he mentioned there's this, uh, mm -hmm. this, this divergent phase and the convergent phase. The divergent phase is that you have like a certain time frame where you start digging into things and collecting information and doing your research. But then he also put an emphasis on you also have to put the same time you spend on researching and actually creating the divergent phase where things are coming together again. So this was quite interesting because most of people, the unsuc unsuccessful entrepreneurs, they, they love to research. They love to talk about the ideas. They love to like come up with ideas and like having the big picture on in their mind, but they are not really coming down and write down like, okay, these are the three steps I need to take now. These are the next things to do. This is the goal I want to reach. Let's go back to the TikTok example. People are coming up with like ideas. Oh, I want to create my, my own persona. I want to be, become an influencer on TikTok. But then you, it turned out they never created really a video. They never really um, distilled from what they found in the research mm -hmm. phase. So um, this is the thing. You, it could be like this perfectionism they, they might be trapped in unknowingly because you, you're thinking, you're still researching, yeah. you're still Again, like... Again, back to the oh, perfectionism to like we were saying in the beginning. Totally, totally. It's like, it's not necessarily a IT company. It's also different things. Artists are also usually susceptible to that because they're like, oh, it doesn't sound perfect. It doesn't, it, it doesn't look perfect, but you need to reach 80%. That's it. And you need to like have small steps. And the, the person who's trying to achieve perfection, he will, they will never get there because 
it they are too slow. So this is also one one really important thing is um, velocity and and speed in in your execution. You can plan like a year ahead of things and come up with like how to approach a customer, how to build a feature. But then you notice like the customer doesn't want that thing again anymore. Like, okay, you wasted a year. <laughs> it might be 100K in, in development capacity for that feature. Mm -hmm. So you, again, the unsuc unsuccessful entrepreneur, they are spending time on unnecessary things. They are not really doing a good planning. They are not really coming to terms with what do I want to really achieve? What are my goals? And this is one pattern I've seen over and over and over again. They are talking but not doing. They're they're like asking for for um, sometimes for like input, and then you start criticizing them, but not like in a bad way, but in a good way. And they're like, oh no, you you mm -hmm. don't get, you don't understand the market. So there's also like they are looking actually in, in fact for a confirmation right. bias. They are feeding into their confirmation bias, talking to the wrong yes. people. So that might also happen. So. Um, yeah, to to wrap it up again, the unsuccessful entrepreneur is spending too much time on on per, on to perfect their product or idea. They are not executing, or they try mm -hmm. to attain an an unachievable goal, which is all bad. You you have to start small and reiterate mm -hmm. over and over and fast to see what the market actually wants from from your mm -hmm. product. Perfect. All right, so now we talked about entrepreneurs. Let's um, rapid fire just about startups in general. What do you think, both of you, what do you think, um, you know, the top three things that startups get wrong that you see over and over again in all startups across industries? So first of all, not, imp not using lean startup approach. So they have an idea and invest all in, in a proper developed uh, product or something without testing it with the ta target audience. That's a big issue. Um, also, many startups are under-organized, very chaotic. And down the road, you get really uh, challenges with that. If you, you get new employees, you, get, uh, you, you remove old employees, and you need processes for that. And the, the third thing is to put too much... To, if, the, if one person or if two person two people are bottlenecks in the whole company, which can make, whenever is this person uh, busy with some other tasks or uh, on vacation, the whole company is not able to move. And instead of that, you need to create uh, processes and rules so that people know what to do, even if you don't, ex uh, if, if the boss is not there. So companies that don't create processes and sort of uh, rules and uh, mechanisms to solve problems. Right. So companies that rely too much on one person doing a thing and then that one person yeah. dies or goes away or goes on vacation or gets sick and the whole company shuts down. Yeah, I feel like you see that a lot. Chris, what about you? What's a thing that you see consistently startups doing wrong uh, across uh, fields. So processes being reliant on one person, I've seen this over and over again, even if you're not working uh, for a startup, but we are working with one, like their service provider. Sometimes you would be like um, talking to your key account person and then that person is on vacation or they are just busy. You're then like, okay, uh, I would like to move forward. <laughs> I have an issue. Why is there no one really helping me now? And then you can also see it from the outside, which is then, I mean, in that situation, you are the customer. You can, you can imagine like what happens like with other customers if they are not being like served anymore because there's like one person trying to manage all of them. So this is really a thing we, we see across from the inside and the outside of, of startups. And one also good point is like, it's for any business. If there's only one person in your business who knows how to do something, if you run a store and there's only one person who knows how to accept a delivery, that's probably a problem. Yeah, definitely. It's It can hit your heart. It can also hit you quite softly, what I've seen before uh, inside of companies, if they want to like uh, mm -hmm. upstaff the team. Um, if you don't have like uh, an onboarding process in place, 
One person of your team needs to spend their time to onboard a new person or multiple new persons. So that person is clocked then for n times, like the amount of people you just hired that week. So um, this is really one thing you need to be, mm. to, be yeah, to keep it in your mind, not to like uh, religiously document every little piece and bit of your and bit mm -hmm. of your company, but also make sure that you have to have certain processes in place before you ramp it up. That can be like accepting deliveries. That can be like picking and packing in your warehouse. Mm -hmm. As soon as you want to scale up thing, you need to write it down so that people can refer to one document or to one thing and they can like help themselves. And um, what also is quite important in, on that matter is if you write something down, you're automatically going to standardize things. Because if you teach people, you might always forgot forget a small little thing here and there like some some step which is required especially if mm -hmm. you need to document new customers new employees and then um you might forget about it and then it could hurt you later like offboarding if you're if you don't keep track on where you're yeah. gonna add your 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 staff like to some services or like your let's say bank account and then they leave or you have to let them go or you have to fire them because they did some really cross neglectant mistake. <clears throat> so you're then like months later discover like, oh, that person still has access and now he's working for my com competitor. What did I do? Did they like, is this the reason why mm -hmm. all of my clients mm -hmm. are going to my competition? Because um, that guy who, who I let go, <laughs> He took all the information we built up the next <laughs> month. So, um, yeah, so this is one thing I, yes. I see from time to time. And he's still on the Google team usually too. Yeah. Like, well, like, yeah, roaming very roaming interesting. Slack, yeah. Like, That's a great tip about onboarding too. Yeah. He's still on Slack. He's got, <laughs> he's got the company information. Yeah. Um, that's that's interesting about onboarding. I wonder how much time gets wasted by, you know, new people at a company asking a veteran how to do something where it could just be a document or a video to explain the whole yeah. thing uh, in a standardized way. So, Will, tell us one business loser that you've seen, something that a company has done that made you go, why would you do that? And Chris, tell us about something a company has done that you've seen recently that made you go, good job, do more of that. Since I've worked with, yeah, since I've worked with Google Ads all the time and with other Google products, it seems for me, uh, it seems to me, it seems to me that um, Google is pushing AI really hard, but the AI is I'm just not there yet where what they wish for for example in google ads they they recommend certain things which don't make sense or they analyze the ad copy which doesn't make sense but they are really following it through which makes it really difficult to work like to work in certain areas with google <laughs> google get your stuff together in the ads department Chris, what about you? What's one thing that made you happy? Oh, speaking of happy. So Zapier makes you happier. In fact, they did recently. So um, I'm using Zapier to automate processes, connecting things together. And they have different plans. They have the free plan where you can do a limited amount of steps and things. And they used to have the starter plan, which was also a bit better, but still limited. For instance, it, they wouldn't automatically retry uh, one of your automated processes processes if they would fail and um, i think last week or the week before i only re uh, noticed it recently they m moved all the starter plans to professional which is way better but they stayed with the same price so you have more features for the same price of 29 bucks a month it's great so this is my biggest win for this week because it solves quite a lot of issues and helps me to build better automated processes for my customers so yeah sapia makes me happier thank you for listening to another episode of masterful.info if you found this episode interesting please share and comment